Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This is being recorded for the January 2021 edition of Socialism for All. This is an audiobook of the Combahee River Collective Statement. The Combahee River Collective was a black feminist lesbian socialist organization active in Boston from 1974 to 1980. And essentially, you know, you might say that's very specific, black feminist socialist lesbian group. Well, why so specific about all those different statuses of, you know, political orientation, socialist, uh, racial status, black, sex, woman, sexual orientation, same sex or lesbian? Uh, Well, why so specific is that although, you know, there was an ongoing uh, movement of women, feminism in the U.S. at that time, these women felt that it was catering more to white women and wasn't uh, meeting their needs as black lesbian socialists. So, you know, in socialism generally, we have this idea that socialist demands are demands for, you know, uh, mass economic demands that get mass traction, etc. The whole working class will benefit, etc. In feminism, you have the same idea that all women will benefit. Well, the thing is, and this is the key thing of intersectionality, is there are interlocking systems of oppression, and all workers are not the same, just the same way all women are not the same, because you have one, more than one social status. You have race, gender, class, etc. And these overlap to create an intersectional identity that is the reason why your experience is different than mine. Uh, we all you know, although it may be similar in some ways and then different in other ways. We all have all of these different statuses. As Marxists, we say that class is the central one, whether you're a proletarian or a capitalist is going to, or petty bourgeois, you know, whatever you are. Uh, That's going to determine the vast majority of your experience. But then within that, you know, all women are not the same. Uh, people of all different races don't have the same experience, etc. So this is the point of intersectionality and identity politics, radical identity politics that centers around class, is trying to get into those other statuses so that we don't wind up erasing differences between people by saying, well, these things are good for all workers or all women or all men, etc., and then erase all of the actually different experiences within that, um, you know, kind of papering over that. We don't want to do that. We actually want a socialism that serves everyone. So that's why we're getting into this. So let's get into the audiobook Again, this is the Combahee River Collective Statement 1977. We are a collective of black feminists who have been meeting together since 1974. During that time, we have been involved in the process of defining and clarifying our politics, while at the same time doing political work within our own group and in coalition with other progressive organizations and movements. The most general statement of our politics at the present time would be that we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, and see as our particular task the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking. The synthesis of these oppressions creates the conditions of our lives. As black women, we see black feminism as the logical political movement to combat the manifold and simultaneous oppressions that all women of color face. We will discuss four major topics in the paper that follows. One, the genesis of contemporary black feminism. Two, what we believe, i.e. the specific province of our politics. Three, the problems in organizing black feminists, including a brief history of our collective. And four, black feminist issues and practice. One, the genesis of contemporary black feminism. Before looking at the recent development of black feminism, we would like to affirm that we find our origins in the historical reality of Afro-American women's continuous life and death struggle for survival and liberation. Black women's extremely negative relationship to the American political system, 
a system of white male rule, has always been determined by our membership in two oppressed racial and sexual castes. As Angela Davis points out in Reflections on the Black Woman's Role in the Community of Slaves, black women have always embodied, if only in their physical manifestation, an adversary stance to white male rule and have actively resisted its inroads upon them and their communities in both dramatic and subtle ways. There have always been black women activists, some known, like Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Frances E.W. Harper, Ida B. Wells Barnett, and Mary Church Terrell, and thousands upon thousands unknown, who have had a shared awareness of how their sexual identity combined with their racial identity to make their whole life situation and the focus of their political struggles unique. Contemporary black feminism is the outgrowth of countless generations of personal sacrifice, militancy, and work by our mothers and sisters. A black feminist presence has evolved most obviously in connection with the second wave of the American women's movement beginning in the late 1960s. Black, other third world, and working women have been involved in the feminist movement from its start, but both outside reactionary forces and racism and elitism within the movement itself have served to obscure our participation. In 1973, black feminists, primarily located in New York, felt the necessity of forming a separate black feminist group. This became the National Black Feminist Organization, NBFO. Black feminist politics also have an obvious connection to movements for black liberation, particularly those of the 1960s and 1970s. Many of us were active in those movements, civil rights, black nationalism, the Black Panthers, and all of our lives were greatly affected and changed by their ideologies, their goals, and the tactics used to achieve their goals. It was our experience and disillusionment within these liberation movements, as well as experience on the periphery of the white male left, that led to the need to develop a politics that was anti-racist, unlike those of white women, and anti-sexist, unlike those of black and white men. There is also undeniably a personal genesis for black feminism, that is, the political realization that comes from the seemingly personal experiences of individual black women's lives. Black feminists and many more black women who do not define themselves as feminists have all experienced sexual oppression as a constant factor in our day-to-day -day existence. As children, we realized that we were different from boys and that we were treated differently. For example, we were told in the same breath to be quiet both for the sake of being, quote, ladylike, and to make us less objectionable in the eyes of white people. As we grew older, we became aware of the threat of physical and sexual abuse by men. However, we had no way of conceptualizing what was so apparent to us, what we knew was really happening. Black feminists often talk about their feelings of craziness before becoming conscious of the concepts of sexual politics, patriarchal rule, and, most importantly, feminism, the political analysis and practice that we women use to struggle against our oppression. The fact that racial politics and indeed racism are pervasive factors in our lives did not allow us, and still does not allow most black women, to look more deeply into our own experiences and, from that sharing and growing consciousness, to build a politics that will change our lives and inevitably end our oppression. Our development must also be tied to the contemporary economic and political position of black people. The post-World War II generation of black youth was the first to be able to minimally partake of certain educational and employment options previously closed completely to black people. Although our economic position is still at the very bottom of the American capitalistic economy, a handful of us have been able to gain certain tools as a result of tokenism in education and employment, which potentially enable us to more effectively fight our oppression. A combined anti-racist and anti-sexist position drew us together initially, and as we developed politically, we addressed ourselves to heterosexism and economic oppression under capitalism. 2. What we believe 
Above all else, our politics initially sprang from the shared belief that black women are inherently valuable, that our liberation is a necessity not as an adjunct to somebody else's, but because of our need as human persons for autonomy. This may seem so obvious as to sound simplistic, but it is apparent that no other ostensibly progressive movement has ever considered our specific oppression as a priority, or worked seriously for the ending of that oppression. Merely naming the pejorative stereotypes attributed to black women, e.g. mammy, matriarch, sapphire, whore, bull dagger, let alone cataloging the cruel, often murderous treatment we receive, indicates how little value has been placed upon our lives during four centuries of bondage in the Western Hemisphere. We realize that the only people who care enough about us to work consistently for our liberation are us. Just a quick comment from S4A. It's a very sad, that's almost like a heartbreaking statement, just reading that. And, uh, you know, my heart goes out right now to ever, everyone who has ever felt that way, that, you know, the only people that they could really rely on was themselves or somebody really, really close to their you know, personal uh, conditions and statuses. Uh, we all need to really, you know, that's why we're doing this video series on intersectionality is to uh, try to uh, reach out, build more bridges and, you know, have more shared understanding of the experiences of people who have uh, different statuses and different experiences. Okay, back to the text. Our politics evolve from a healthy love for ourselves, our sisters, and our community, which allows us to continue our struggle and work. This focusing upon our own oppression is embodied in the concept of identity politics. We believe that the most profound and potentially most radical politics comes directly out of our own identity, as opposed to working to end somebody else's oppression. In the case of black women, this is a particularly repugnant, dangerous, threatening, and therefore revolutionary concept because it is obvious from looking at all the political movements that have preceded us that anyone is more worthy of liberation than ourselves. We reject pedestals, queenhood, and walking ten paces behind. To be recognized as human, levelly human, is enough. We believe that sexual politics under patriarchy is as pervasive in black women's lives as are the politics of class and race. We also often find it difficult to separate race from class from sex oppression because in our lives they are most often experienced simultaneously. We know that there is such a thing as racial sexual oppression which is neither solely racial nor solely sexual, e.g. the history of rape of black women by white men as a weapon of political repression. Although we are feminists and lesbians, we feel solidarity with progressive black men and do not advocate the fractionalization that white women who are separatists demand. Our situation as black people necessitates that we have solidarity around the fact of race, which white women, of course, do not need to have with white men unless it is their negative solidarity as racial oppressors. We struggle together with black men against racism, while we also struggle with black men about sexism. We realize that the liberation of all oppressed peoples necessitates the destruction of the political economic systems of capitalism and imperialism as well as patriarchy. We are socialists because we believe that work must be organized for the collective benefit of those who do the work and create the products and not for the profit of the bosses. Material resources must be equally distributed among those who create these resources. We are not convinced, however, that a socialist revolution that is not also a feminist and anti-racist revolution will guarantee our liberation. We have arrived at the necessity for developing an understanding of class relationships that takes into account the specific class position of black women who are generally marginal in the labor force, while at this particular time some of us are temporarily viewed as doubly desirable tokens at white-collar and professional levels. We need to articulate the real class situation of persons who are not merely raceless, sexless workers, 
but for whom racial and sexual oppression are significant determinants in their working and economic lives. Although we are in essential agreement with Marx's theory as it applied to the very specific economic relationships he analyzed, we know that his analysis must be extended further in order for us to understand our specific economic situation as black women. A political contribution which we feel we have already made is the expansion of the feminist principle that the personal is political. In our consciousness-raising sessions, for example, we have in many ways gone beyond white women's revelations because we are dealing with the implications of race and class as well as sex. Even our black women's style of talking and testifying in black language about what we have experienced has a resonance that is both cultural and political. We have spent a great deal of energy delving into the cultural and experiential nature of our oppression out of necessity because none of these matters has ever been looked at before. No one before has ever examined the multi-layered texture of black women's lives. An example of this kind of revelation or conceptualization occurred at a meeting as we discussed the ways in which our early intellectual interests had been attacked by our peers, particularly black males. We discovered that all of us, because we were, quote, smart, had also been considered, quote, ugly, i.e., quote, smart ugly. Smart ugly crystallized the way in which most of us had been forced to develop our intellects at great cost to our, quote, social lives. The sanctions in the black and white communities against black women thinkers is comparatively much higher than for white women, particularly ones from the educated middle and upper classes. As we have already stated, we reject the stance of lesbian separatism because it is not a viable political analysis or strategy for us. It leaves out far too much and far too many people, particularly black men, women, and children. We have a great deal of criticism and loathing for what men have been socialized to be in this society, what they support, how they act, and how they oppress. But we do not have the misguided notion that it is their maleness per se, i.e. their biological maleness, that makes them what they are. As black women, we find any type of biological determinism a particularly dangerous and reactionary basis upon which to build a politic. A quick comment from S4A. If you look at things like Jordan Peterson now, who is trying to resurrect a lot of this crap, um, evolutionary biology... This is like one of the new faces of this biological determinism that's trying to say, no, we're just locked into these oppressions and we can never overcome them because they're in our DNA, et cetera. Well, this statement, and S4A is in full agreement, uh, says, no, there's nothing in our biology that says we need to be oppressors. We can absolutely make new social arrangements that uh, come to new understandings and agreements about social roles and cooperation. Okay, back to the text. We must also question whether lesbian separatism is an adequate and progressive political analysis and strategy even for those who practice it, since it so completely denies any but the sexual sources of women's oppression, negating the facts of class and race. Three, problems in organizing black feminists. During our years together as a black feminist collective, We have experienced success and defeat, joy and pain, victory and failure. We have found that it is very difficult to organize around black feminist issues, difficult even to announce in certain contexts that we are black feminists. We have tried to think about the reasons for our difficulties, particularly since the white women's movement continues to be strong and to grow in many directions. In this section, we will discuss some of the general reasons for the organizing problems we face and also talk specifically about the stages in organizing our own collective. The major source of difficulty in our political work is that we are not just trying to fight oppression on one front or even two, but instead to address a whole range of oppressions. We do not have racial, sexual, heterosexual, or class privilege to rely upon, nor do we have even the minimal access to resources and power that groups who possess any one of these types of privilege have. The psychological toll of being a black woman 
and the difficulties this presents in reaching political consciousness and doing political work can never be underestimated. There is a very low value placed upon black women's psyches in this society, which is both racist and sexist. As an early group member once said, quote, we are all damaged people merely by virtue of being black women, unquote. We are dispossessed psychologically and on every other level, and yet we feel the necessity to struggle to change the condition of all black women. In A Black Feminist's Search for Sisterhood, Michelle Wallace arrives at this conclusion. We exist as women who are black, who are feminists, each stranded for the moment, working independently because there is not yet an environment in this society remotely congenial to our struggle, because, being on the bottom, we would have to do what no one else has done. We would have to fight the world. Wallace is pessimistic but realistic in her assessment of black feminists' position, particularly in her allusion to the nearly classic isolation most of us face. We might use our position at the bottom, however, to make a clear leap into revolutionary action. If black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all the systems of oppression. Feminism is, nevertheless, very threatening to the majority of black people because it calls into question some of the most basic assumptions about our existence, i.e. that sex should be a determinant of power relationships. Here is the way male and female roles were defined in a black nationalist pamphlet from the early 1970s. Quote, We understand that it is and has been traditional that the man is the head of his house. He is the leader of the house slash nation. Because his knowledge of the world is broader, his awareness is greater, his understanding is fuller, and his application of this information is wiser. After all, it is only reasonable that the man be the head of the house because he is able to defend and protect the development of his home. Women cannot do the same things as men. They are made by nature to function differently. Equality of men and women is something that cannot happen even in the abstract world. Men are not equal to other men, i.e. ability, experience, or even understanding. The value of men and women can be seen as in the value of gold and silver. They are not equal, but both have great value. We must realize that men and women are a complement to each other because there is no house or family without a man and his wife. Both are essential to the development of any life." Unquote. The material conditions of most black women would hardly lead them to upset both economic and sexual arrangements that seem to represent some stability in their lives. Many black women have a good understanding of both sexism and racism, but because of the everyday constrictions of their lives, cannot risk struggling against them both. The reaction of black men to feminism has been notoriously negative. They are, of course, even more threatened than black women by the possibility that black feminists might organize around our own needs. They realize that they might not only lose valuable and hardworking allies in their struggles, but that they might also be forced to change their habitually sexist ways of interacting with and oppressing black women. Accusations that black feminism divides the black struggle are powerful deterrents to the growth of an autonomous black women's movement. And just a quick comment here from S4A. Uh, I've put up one Malcolm X clip uh, so far last month and have a bunch more that are going to be going up on the channel this month and next. Um, you can hear some of these notions in Malcolm's speeches, uh, you know, about what men can do versus what old women can do and sort of talk of emasculation. And yeah, I mean, uh, black men definitely in the United States in any white supremacist society like the United States get excluded from uh, the male privilege that is primarily afforded to white men. So, you know, there is a hierarchy within male privilege by race and black men often, you know, are struggling for that sense of dignity. Um, thing is, you know, all of us as we struggle, you know, that dignity shouldn't be had at the expense of someone else. In other words, I have that dignity because I'm superior to this person who, you know, really is my equal, who in, 
I mean, directly in that pamphlet they're arguing is not their equal. Uh, that doesn't really help anybody. We all need to have dignity uh, in cooperation and equality, not dignity at the expense of someone else. Understandably, though, you know, for black men trying to, um, you know, who, who may be comparing themselves primarily to white men, uh, you know, trying to have that dignity and the opportunities that like white men have, you know, but definitely no men, <laughs> white or otherwise, should have uh, privilege over women. Uh, okay, I think I beat this point into the ground. Let's continue. Still, hundreds of women have been active at different times during the three-year existence of our group. And every black woman who came, came out of a strongly felt need for some level of possibility that did not previously exist in her life. When we first started meeting early in 1974, after the NBFO First Eastern Regional Conference, we did not have a strategy for organizing, or even a focus. We just wanted to see what we had. After a period of months of not meeting, we began to meet again late in the year and started doing an intense variety of consciousness raising. The overwhelming feeling that we had is that after years and years, we had finally found each other. Although we were not doing political work as a group, individuals continued their involvement in lesbian politics, sterilization, abuse, and abortion rights work, Third World Women's International Women's Day activities, and support activities for the trials of Dr. Kenneth Adelin, Joan Little, and Inez Garcia. During our first summer, when membership had dropped off considerably, those of us remaining devoted serious discussion to the possibility of opening a refuge for battered women in a black community. Parentheses, there was no refuge in Boston at that time. We also decided around that time to become an independent collective, since we had serious disagreements with NBFO's bourgeois feminist stance and their lack of a clear political focus. We also were contacted at that time by socialist feminists, with whom we had worked on abortion rights activities, who wanted to encourage us to attend the National Socialist Feminist Conference in Yellow Springs. One of our members did attend, and despite the narrowness of the ideology that was promoted at that particular conference, we became more aware of the need for us to understand our own economic situation and to make our own economic analysis. In the fall, when some members returned, we experienced several months of comparative inactivity and internal disagreements, which were first conceptualized as a lesbian straight split, but which were also the result of class and political differences. During the summer, those of us who were still meeting had determined the need to do political work and to move beyond consciousness raising and serving exclusively as an emotional support group. At the beginning of 1976, when some of the women who had not wanted to do political work and who also had voiced disagreements stopped attending of their own accord, we again looked for a focus. We decided at that time, with the addition of new members, to become a study group. We had always shared our reading with each other, and some of us had written papers on black feminism for group discussion a few months before this decision was made. We began functioning as a study group and also began discussing the possibility of starting a black feminist publication. We had a retreat in the late spring, which provided a time for both political discussion and working out interpersonal issues. Currently, we are planning to gather together a collection of black feminist writing. We feel that it is absolutely essential to demonstrate the reality of our politics to other black women and believe that we can do this through writing and distributing our work. The fact that individual black feminists are living in isolation all over the country, that our own numbers are small, and that we have some skills in writing, printing, and publishing makes us want to carry out these kinds of projects as a means of organizing black feminists as we continue to do political work in coalition with other groups. 4. Black Feminist Issues and Projects during our time together, we have identified and worked on many issues of particular relevance to black women. The inclusiveness of our politics makes us concerned with any situation that impinges upon the lives of women, third world, and working people. 
We are, of course, particularly committed to working on those struggles in which sex, race, and class are simultaneous factors in oppression. We might, for example, become involved in workplace organizing at a factory that employs third world women or pick at a hospital that is cutting back on already inadequate health care to a third world community or set up a rape crisis center in a black neighborhood. Organizing around welfare and daycare concerns might also be a focus. The work to be done and the countless issues that this work represents merely reflect the pervasiveness of our oppression. Issues and projects that collective members have actually worked on are sterilization abuse, abortion rights, battered women, rape, and health care. We have also done many workshops and educationals on black feminism on college campuses, at women's conferences, and most recently for high school women. One issue that is of major concern to us and that we have begun to publicly address is racism in the white women's movement. As black feminists, we are made constantly and painfully aware of how little effort white women have made to understand and combat their racism, which requires, among other things, that they have a more than superficial comprehension of race, color, and black history and culture. Eliminating racism in the white women's movement is by definition work for white women to do, but we will continue to speak to and demand accountability on this issue. In the practice of our politics, we do not believe that the end always justifies the means. Many reactionary and destructive acts have been done in the name of achieving, quote, correct political goals. As feminists, we do not want to mess over people in the name of politics. We believe in collective process and a non-hierarchical distribution of power within our own group and in our vision of a revolutionary society. We are committed to a continual examination of our politics as they develop through criticism and self-criticism as an essential aspect of our practice. In her introduction to Sisterhood is Powerful, Robin Morgan writes, I haven't the faintest notion what possible revolutionary role white heterosexual men could fulfill since they are the very embodiment of reactionary vested interest power. As black feminists and lesbians, we know that we have a very definite revolutionary task to perform and we are ready for the lifetime of work and struggle before us. And that is the end of the document, the Combahee River Collective Statement, uh, 1977, published uh, then in 1978. And now let's go over some notes and comments. So mainly, uh, I don't actually have so many uh, comments as just notes on some of the names that were mentioned. Uh, in case anyone's not familiar with these names, I just wanted to give a little bit of uh, background. Francis Harper, uh, also known as Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, lived from 1825 to 1911. She was an abolitionist, suffragist, poet, teacher, public speaker, and writer, and one of the first African-American women to be published in the United States. Harriet Tubman was born Araminta Ross, 1822, uh, died in 1913. She was an American abolitionist and political activist, of course, uh, very well known actually for her involvement with the Underground Railroad that helped uh, slaves to escape from the South to the North in the United States. Ida B. Wells, or Ida Bell Wells Barnett, uh, lived from 1862 to 1931. She was an American investigative journalist, educator, and early leader in the civil rights movement. She was one of the founders of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. She was born into slavery and then uh, was freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. Mary Church Terrell lived from 1863 to 1954, was one of the first African-American women to earn a college degree, became a national activist for civil rights and suffrage. Sojourner Truth, uh, also known as Isabella Bell Bomfrey, born in 1797, lived to 1883, was an American abolitionist and women's rights activist. She was born into slavery in New York, but she escaped with her infant daughter to freedom in 1826. A few more names mentioned in the document were people whose trials the collective supported. 
Uh, so Joanne Little, uh, her name is written J-O-A-N, so it looks like Joan, but it's actually pronounced Joanne. Born in 1953, an African-American woman who was tried uh, for the 1974 murder of Clarence Allgood, a white prison guard at the Beaufort County Jail in Washington, North Carolina. Um, became a very famous trial because she was acquitted using the defense that she used deadly force to resist sexual assault uh, by that prison guard. Another name mentioned uh, is Kenneth C. Adlin, born 1939, died 2013. He was an American physician known for his support of abortion rights and advocacy for indigent parents' rights to health care. Born in Washington, D.C., died in Florida. Uh, so in 1975, he was convicted of manslaughter after performing an abortion in the Boston City Hospital at the wish of the pregnant woman, uh, prosecuted by Newman A. Flanagan. So another, in this case, abortionist who the uh, collective was working um, in legal support of during his trial. And finally, Inez Garcia, born 1941, was a Hispanic woman uh, who was charged with the 1974 murder of a man who had raped her, so similar in that sense to uh, Joanne Little. Finally, just a few notes on the collective themselves. You can look up who was involved in the collective. Um, it was an open membership and was described as fluid, so there were many women who kind of came and went over the years. Many of the former members, uh, if you look up, are now involved in teaching women's studies or teaching gender studies uh, or involved in literature, poetry, things like that. A few are quite famous. Actually, one of the probably the most famous members is Sherlane McRae. She is actually currently the wife of Bill de Blasio, so <laughs> fairly prominent. Uh, most of the former members are not as famous and you know are doing work more similar uh, to what they did in the Combahee River Collective. One final note is on the name of the collective itself. Uh, this was taken from the raid at Combahee Ferry. Uh, one of the members had a book called Harriet Tubman, Conductor on the Underground Railroad. And um, they were looking to name the collective after a historical event that was meaningful to African-American women. Uh, so the raid on the Combahee Ferry was planned and led by Harriet Tubman on June 2nd, 1863 in the Port Royal region of South Carolina. It was an action that freed more than 750 slaves. And on that, we're going to leave it here. What did you think? Leave a comment. I thought this was a very interesting document as usual and uh, glad to have entered it into the Socialism for All corpus. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you on the next one. And that's the video. Thanks to our current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen or just support us financially, you can go to patreon.com slash socialism for all and sign up for a monthly donation. You can also follow us at facebook.com slash socialism, the number for all used to have a page at F O R all and it got throttled to death by Zuck here on YouTube. Please click the like button, subscribe button and the notifications bell. Please leave a comment if you can, and please share our video wherever you're online, your Twitter feed, your Discord servers, Reddit subs, etc. All of that helps more people to see this content, whether it's in the YouTube algorithm or just posting it on other sites. All of that's helpful. All of you out there supporting and promoting this content makes it all go that much more smoothly. We need to end capitalism, normalize talking about socialism today, and uh, it's really kind of our only hope for a better tomorrow. Thanks for all you do, and we will catch you in the next video.